Hello and welcome to the Dragon Slayer podcast. I'm Jamie and joining me as always is Gavin Thomas. How are you doing, Gav? Well, uh, kind of it's very recently that we last spoke, but still doing well, Jamie. Still uh, bumbling along in the world of grassroots rugby. Excellent. We had some uh, really good feedback, by the way, on the Reese Blumberg part. A lot of people got in touch to say how much they enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for their comments and feedback on that one. And just a reminder before we start that you can find us in all the usual places, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. And don't forget to follow us on our social media channels, Facebook and X. OK, so we have another special guest for you this week, a former front rower who spent nine seasons at the Dragons and made 149 appearances for the club. Throughout his time with the men of Gwent, he made appearances for clubs such as Ebervale, Bedworth, Pontypool, Cross Keys and Newport. So what's he up to these days? Well, these days he's Swansea RFC's head coach, he's academy skills coach at the Ospreys and he's rugby performance manager for Swansea University as well. Fair play, he's a busy bloke, mind, isn't he? <laughs> How's he got the time to do all this? I don't know. But let's ask him anyway. Welcome to the pod, Hugo Stafford. How are we doing, Hugh? Hey, nice, nice to speak to you both. Privilege, privilege to be on. I've seen Steve Jones on there. I've waited for my call, then. Ah, uh, yeah, we've day. had Jabba on. Yeah. We've had Jabba. I've Jabba for cake and coffee. And uh, <laughs> my call, no. Yeah, it's a privilege to be on. Thank you for offering me to come on. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. So let's start at the beginning then, as we do with all our guests who play pro rugby. Um, tell us about your journey into rugby. How and where did it begin? Ah, well, I started in Tumble RFC, so it's probably in the tens. Um, we, there was no tag rugby back in the day, so it was just straight into the boys in my school. There's only about four boys in my school live in a, a rural village in Wales. Uh, picked up my brother played rugby for Tumble. I had to play for Neath for a while and then before you went up to England to play and then you full-time now uh, as a physiotherapist. But I started at a young age with Tumble and I went through Tumble then, played schoolboy rugby with a month mouth, went through to West Wales, A's and B's and all that, went through then, uh, carried on through Tumble to a certain age and then got picked up by Scarlet's Academy. Well, I played for Snecky under 18s at the time before any regional rugby was in uh, Europe, before regional rugby. Mm. Then with the Scots under 18s, called, called an academy. Journey Wales under 18s, Wales Youth. First ever Wales, uh, when a joint youth and school boys together, first ever 18s captain, did 20s, 21s finish, but time I went to 21s. After Scarlet, there was an opportunity when I finished as captain for Wales, and Lee Jones was head coach and Tyrese. Mm. And there was an opportunity for me to, oh, Wayne Jones was there as well, his brother. So, opportunity for me maybe. To change kind of been with West Wales for so long, opportunities there were quite limited with the depth of chat with yes and Thomas. There's some really good props down there. I probably had to buy my time but too bit longer than other players. So mm. an opportunity to move on. And I thought the Dragons being probably depth chat wise, Adam Black at the time. I know we but I could maybe work my way in and had opportunity to be a die, you know, to go in. But I loved it. I've been there for nine years. And uh, at the end, there was an opportunity for me to change scenery and kind of look at my journey after rugby as well. Um, so I looked into that as well. You know, when I was hard decision to make, you know, it was quite tough time. Some really good times, some tough times, the Dragons, but mm. a decision to move on with an opportunity to go into coaching probably more. And my role changing as a player as more of a leader, not playing as often, but kind of understanding my role with Steve Tandy, direction he wanted me to go with the younger guys. Um, but I loved every minute of it, and I've had some amazing times. The Dragons, a young age, and I met some fantastic people, and we've gone through a lot of tough times. And the fans have been there with us, and it was a really tough time. But then some epic adventures and epic wins as well on the way. Oh, excellent! So you made your Dragons debut against the Scarlets, wasn't it, back in two thousand and seven? Yeah. What are your memories from that day? Can you remember yeah. much about it? I couldn't wait to play. I've been well. My father and myself go with, and my brother. So he's a ticket older. My grandmother, rest, rest, rest in peace. She used to live literally two minutes walk from Shrey Park. So I was a yeah. an FC fan for a long time, watching the rugby and playing there as a junior in the region, and now actually playing as opposition and actually winning that game as well. Uh, mm. It was quite exciting. I remember coming off the bench in those days. There was only one prop cover, wasn't two. So, oh, yeah. uh, so I was there and the, uh, playing. I remember Jabba and tying people's laces, <laughs> and Andy Williams and nine. And um, yeah, and have that win as well. It was quite a special moment. Oh, great stuff. So you made your name at Ronnie Parade for being a dependable front rower, and you arrived at the Dragons as a prop. But then in 2012, you converted to hooker. So I'm just wondering, how did that 
switch come about? Was that something that the coaches suggested for you, or was that something that you just fancy try, you know, trying no. something different? Or no, the coaches exactly because the way I was playing, I was quite impactful my ball carrying and my skills, but. I wasn't the biggest guy. He wasn't hitting 120 kilograms. It wasn't that heavy where the scrum was changing. Um, I remember playing against, I think it was Calvisan or Pelot Calvisan. It was like Italian team. And I you know, made a line break with a few tackles, a couple of jackals off the bench. And they thought I was quite dynamic as I was. And they asked me, well, would you be able to play both? I think they also saved money to have two players for one. <laughs> so I, uh, um, it's a tough place to be at a late age of career. But I thought, no, I'll give it a go. And I was learning from my mistakes and trying to get better from it and be in. Mr. Dependable there, I just give it a go. And having people like Steve Jones, who I was close mates with, and I, I respect Jabba more than ever in the world, and him helping me, and Sadoli as well, Rob Sadoli helping me on those one to ones at the end of sessions. And those guys, I always be you know, thankful for giving me the opportunity to practice with extra reps. So, in terms of propping, do you think the role of prop has changed in the time you've been playing and coaching? Um. Yeah, it did go through a stage with a hit and the size of people. I remember playing Sheridan, John Hayes, these people, and it's changed now almost full circle. I probably now I'd probably be better off being my size was back then when we didn't have a, we didn't have it was a hit, the old fashioned, you no know, gone through well, so many different variations of scrum setups to now, but now it's almost a small hit. It's all been a compactful and um so it's changed huge now the game has. Um I remember like I think it's Sheridan for sale. He's played there, and a few John A's for months. There's a few big men. Yeah. Uh, with the hit, even Adam Jones bomb. I think it's against the Ospreys when he used to have a hit. Him, Duncan Adam, hit bad. Who's had to take sometimes the hit, but now the hit's gone away. It's almost a pre engaged shunt. That probably size, height, and size not huge. I mean, it's been, been powerful in that position. So, what do you think the key to scrimmage and then is now? Because like you say, your bomb was probably the best at that period because he did that initial hit he did with such force, and he? he? Kind of took away any potential sting. So, so who? How are you winning the battle now as a front rower? Look, side still wins. Just South Africa, uh, <laughs> not huge for height. Look at the front row; they're not huge six foot four props. They quite stocky and powerful. It's it's having that force, but having a back five that are one hundred twenty five, one hundred thirty five k doesn't. It does help by being probably powerful in a short distance. Before, when you didn't have a bind, you could just touch and ready to be explosive and be long over the space, being be now compactful and powerful in a, in a small space and holding that shape, being strong in a, in a short position. Because the scrum's now almost a predetermined squeeze and then be explosive. Yeah. Before. You win the hit, you win the mark, and you can roll the top of people, but now you can't be too powerful. You can't go across the mark too early. You watch that, that South Africa documentary, how powerful they are. Yeah. The short distance being very explosive, but look at the size of them. They are wide as they are tall. They're not six foot five, six foot six. They are six foot, if that's six foot one, maybe. They're all powerful short men. Do you think the bind, the importance of the bind has shifted as well? Because I can remember kind of playing front row where you know, it was about having that long bind and then as quickly as you possibly could get under the armpit and yanking them in. But you, that doesn't happen as much now, does it's it? That a, kind of binds. It's probably been powerful with scaps as well. And loose said now, because the top tight is only binding your arm. It's been powerful enough for your bind or your scaps, your elbows high. The refs have been, some refs not sure what's going on because they're not on the front row, but they have clear pictures to see, like a 90 degree elbow. So they are looking mm. at certain pictures. Um, you can still get away with some dark arts in there. Jabba can tell you, and a few others can tell you. But it's being strong in opposition for long for eight seconds plus, being able to be look look. Some of these guys are so strong now. Mm. Then yeah. years ago, you walk some of these academy players walk around squatting and they're phenomenal athletes. Being strong in that position for eight seconds is going to be huge. That tension building on the bind, so the bind you could win a scrum on the bind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by transferring a bit of weight and being clever about where you bind and make people feel uncomfortable. Because before you hit and you catch people uncomfortable, but now you're going to make people be feeling really uncomfortable on the bind and close the gap and certain scrums. And But it's all about how can you get in that shape the quickest on the bind and be more comfortable. Um, but before, it wouldn't be literally crouch, touch, and engage, and you have Adam Jones back in the back of your neck yes. in the hole, and they'd <laughs> chase the ref would love it. And the scrum has changed so much. Now, one for safety and one for clear pictures and... It was like crouch, touch, hold, pause, engage. So many different rule variations. <clears throat> time. And people's legs used to shake before the pause and then collapse the scrum anyway. So, but I think being strong in that short position, 
for eight seconds and being really strong with your back and your legs, and that's where the power comes from. And like I said, Slap are probably the best at the minute at the moment. Yeah, they certainly do. So when you was at the Dragons, you played under various head coaches, then you played under Paul Turner, Darren Edwards, Lynn Jones. Who did you particularly enjoy working with out of those head coaches? And were there any sort of support staff there that you enjoyed working with and learning from? Like I think they're all different variations of you pick up different things with different coaches and like mm. as a coach you probably mimic and you don't realize you're doing it. No, Paul Turner probably had the most memory of rugby games and things you probably don't really see. And he yeah. knew players and he knew players' habits. He knew what opposition. He must have watched so much rugby in his off time that he knew everybody and anything about rugby. Um, mm. he was a passionate Gwent man as well. Hell of a player back in the day, Paul Turner. Before my time, I must yeah, admit, but he was a very good player. Yeah, I've seen some clips. A new bridge. When he was a new bridge, would he play for yeah. New Yeah. And Newport. Yeah. And Newport, yeah. I the remember ball. him playing. He was excellent. Um, excellent. Like, he was he was a fun... Th- you see him drop goal in on his foot. He used to pull Jason Tubby aside and go watch his Jason and he'd drop kicks and drop a kick. <laughs> yeah. So, as a um, West Walian, who you disagree with me, but I always thought he should have been uh, Red Wells 10 instead of Jonathan Davis, slight bit of Gwent bias, possibly. I thought, I thought, but, uh... you know, <laughs> Castello, and I think Paul's too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I've seen clips of Paul, and like I said, he's fantastic at playing, Mr. a true man of Gwent, he knew a lot yeah. of people, and people knew him, and you no, know, and some stuff we created when he was there was really some fantastic wins, and you no, know, and Paul would say stuff to you, and you think, how do you remember that? There's detail for the game. Mm. Um, but when at one stage I was there, when Lynn Jones came under Paul as a skills coach when he left the Ospreys, Lynn for a bit. I learned a lot from okay. Lynn then. Then he came back then. I called Travis at one stage he was a player coach. He came across Colin. That's right. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot from Dan Edwards when he was a skills coach. Um, I learned a lot from uh, Darren. He was, I thought he was a really good skills coach. Different when he's head coach then. Things change. Um, learned a lot from Danny Wilson. Something I didn't agree with but agreed with some of the stuff he said and yeah. Um, Lynn Jones, uh, Lee Jones, the psychology of the game. Um, mm. He used to say stuff to me, and I just go, "Wow, well, I, I have to go home and have a cry, a cry to think about that." But, he, he would play, <laughs> but fantastic! I look what he is now. What he did with Leicester, with Japan, like I think Lee gets for on a bit sometimes. Lee Jones, um, mm. his brother Wayne as well. I did at the academy. Um, yeah, I took a lot from all different coaches. They all had probably different things we took from each other. Um, some coaches you really you switch on and think I really buy in. The next coach come in. Only issue with, with the dragons when you had rapport, the next coach would come in and you kind of go right. That's a new guy. Got to learn a new system and quite a yeah. it changed quite often. And mm. I think Paul was my longest coach I was under. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, he was a good coach, wasn't he, Paul? And I think people forget. You know, I know it's been um, some tough years at the dragons, but when you look back, the dragons did not have the resources that they got now, and. To be fair, Hugh, you guys, you punched above your weight because you didn't have a proper gym, did you? He was training in the cabbage patch and you didn't have the facilities, but you still managed to be competitive, more competitive than what we've been in recent years. Sometimes the joke was bring a bag and fill up everything. We didn't know where we were, where we were going to yeah. and what facility we were going to have. So sometimes we're down to spit D and, on the, and then we drive then to the gym. The gym then didn't have any heating, so when the boys had a gas cylinder and heated up the gym, and then we had a <laughs> because we could kill everyone with a gas leak, so we pull that out. <laughs> we wear gloves. So in the winter, we had to wear gloves in the gym and a hoodie to the bench because the bars were so cold. Oh gosh! And they knocked down the gym for the busy stand. We had to go underneath a facility, and Luke Charles couldn't even squat to stand underneath. So. <laughs> so um, I remember playing on the cap. Cabbage patch in the summer, you break your legs, it's so hard, and they went do drown. So, <laughs> on that cabbage patch. But one thing, when I was there the first ball, the boys would say, Look, we don't care who, what they've got for for you. And if we can yeah. train in this and we're tight as a group, the Jamie Ringers, the Adam Blacks, the Steve Jones, the Reese Thomas, the Luke mm. Charles, the Michael Owens, you can name them all. Andy yeah. Williams, K Sweeney's, look at that. Those guys were like, Don't want be privileged to be here and we're tight and as a group. But sometimes, we lose the game, but it was competitive, and the boys would say, "Look, if we're going to yeah. go, we're going to go die in." And then, and they were actually trained the like, guys well. I remember how many times we've gone in training session; it's full blown. And mm. I, and it sounds silly. I used to love going to training, even if I didn't get picked. Oh, I was on the bench most of the time. I loved being on those guys. You learned so much, but also they wanted to be there and made you want to be there and fight for something. Yeah, and I, it was a fantastic one of my first couple of years with those lads. It was kind of a diehard kind of atmosphere of. We've got nothing, but we make sure they know about it when they turn up the Rodney Parade. 
as a coach yeah. now, Hill, is that what you want from players? Do you want players who are there are just busting their gut in training? Look, rugby is a pretty ugly game. Let's be honest. We can't have pretty rugby in Wales at the moment, but it's it's August now, and I went at the bottom of my team tonight. There was fog and rain. It was August. <laughs> um, if you don't want to be there, there's going to be a problem eventually. Um, we've got to have people who want to be rugby players and want to play hard and want to play some rugby, but they have to be happy and comfortable. You, we've got to understand that the 4G and the gym, it is nice, it is there, because we've got to support our players. Look at these athletes we're producing with the right atmosphere, but rugby is ugly, it's not nice. You've got to remember that, that you've got to put your body yeah. in the line and the cause. That it's not multi-million pound like football players. Like I would love to be a reserve goalkeeper. Most times I bench for the Dragons, but I wish I had a goalkeeper's money. I <laughs> and, um, but we've got to realise as well that it is... It is physical, it's dangerous. We've got to look after each other. We are going to put our bodies on line and we're going to do that. But how are we going to recover afterwards? We can't just think, right, next day, get up, let's do another session. It's how we periodize the session, look after our players. But they've got to be committed to something. That could be anything. That could be for the university playing varsity. That's the beat Cardiff. That's um, for the best regions. For the, like, you've got to have something to play for and you've got to be tight as a group. And when you haven't got that, it's difficult to motivate people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, we had a couple of listeners' questions. Um, first one from the Ronnie Rowe fan account. Uh, you've mentioned a few of them already, but he said, "Who are your favourite teammate, or were your favourite teammates at the Dragons?" Uh, like Jab is one of them. I thought Luke's such a Jab, the dark ass, the guy's so funny. He never lost. Yeah, to be phenomenal touch rugby player, tough guy for his size. Like people don't underestimate Jab as one of the best players I played with as a rugby player. Mm. Uh, I came through with Dan Lydia, so me and Dan Lydia were kind of housemates, and then like, you now we played through our first couple of starts together. The night he broke his neck, you now we were there. Um, yeah, remember that. Yeah, and kept me on. So I've gone through a lot with Dan at the time. Um, like Luke Chartres, learned so much. Shadoli, like the, like there's some guys there, like even Reese Thomas. As much as mad he was, he learned so much from him, but he was a mad man, and I know he's found yeah. a lifestyle now, but he was great. Adam Black. As a team bloke, as as a, just learned a lot as how we got the team together, made sure it was collected. Jimmy Ringer, how mad he was, and how competitive in training he was, made sure we push each other. He's been on the pod as well. Yeah. Too. Jimmy, We've had Ringer on. He was good yeah, guest when he gave. He like, was. He, yeah. I remember Jimmy Ringer trying to ruck me and trainers on on the cabbage patch. <laughs> trying to stamp on me as a bit of eye opener when trainers <laughs> on and just being competitive, just. I'm, if I'm going to play for the Dragons or play any jersey on, I'm going to give everything I got. And if that's me coming yeah. off that time, I'm, I'm drained. Um, and Michael Owen, what a quiet, quiet guy, what a fantastic rugby player. Um, mm-hmm. I, I probably yeah. the likes of my age group was Shanksy Lewis Evans, yeah, uh, Shanksy Ash Smith, yeah, yet Tavi. Um, those kind of group of guys we were you know quite tight to work. We came through at a young age, played quite a lot of rugby at a young age, and that's we've come right through together then. I played with yeah. Shanks and Dan for the age grade against each other for regional when I played for Scars Rag and they played for Dragons Rag and uh mm. each other for, age, for a long time. And Lydia's still going, of course. Yeah, he's still there. You've got another year of dragons. No, not just having the guy around the place. I don't know how he's physically feeling now, but the history he's played and the games he's played in. The volume of rugby, the intensity, yeah. the history of Lions, Grand Slam winning player, because he's been last few years injured, come back injured. The stuff he knows is people will never learn in a lifetime. So yeah. to have him in a young back row, they've got the draggers now. He's fantastic to have around. Even if he said he's not plays off things, the young guys, but having him there and help develop them is going to be huge learning curve for those young back rowers. It's interesting you talking about Dan Liddy as well, because I think he's the most underrated player. Of the of the Gatland era, because you know people talk about tips and they'll talk about uh, you know kind of Warburton and all these players, but would Lydia just put in a shift and he was a he was a workhorse? Well, well, the back was so balanced. Yeah, I, mm. I told him he could do his thing when Dan was there and Sam could do his thing because they all did something for each other. I think when the balance was so good, he doesn't get seen. But a grand slam when they beat France, I think it was Dan had won the match. Did, but then yeah. I went to watch him and I went out for food and I made a free Wagamamas. I remember that day. <laughs> he won the Grand Slam. The next day went for Wagamamas and he get the chef of his free food because he had, he had his Grand Slam. But that game, he just, all he did was tackle. 
Yeah. They saw France playing, and then Warburton could throw the ball down and we could free to carry. And I thought the balance of Gatlin's team, the way he went into play, and that team he picked suited the way, and, and they all bounced off, out off each other. As a coach, then, is that what you want from a six? I'm very old fashioned, and I think <laughs> sixes should just tackle people and not do a lot else. What, what, what do you think for a back row? What, what's the right balance for a back row? If, if you've got a checkbook, you do what you want. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it is where you play at the moment in university. I've got two seconds, 123 kilograms, 118 kilograms. So I need my six to jump. Yeah. yeah, because my segments are not as powerful. But you're, you're not getting those up in the air. Yeah, but the sticks would be like they will drop. Yeah, so I think in probably semi pro, depending on you know, what club and how much money you've got, it's different now than you've become rugby company league. It's balance and what you can recruit and what you can retain in university and what you can work around. If you've got a checkbook, it's where you want to play. If I want to, at the moment, in South Africa, you should pick the biggest pack. You do that. I mean, yeah. As a coach, you've got your own stance and you've got your own standards and how you want to do something, but also the players have to fit into it. And if you've got round pegs, you can't shove them square holes. You've got to yeah, kind absolutely. of curve them and mould them and help each other. But I think it just all depends on your balance. If you've got someone like Tip Rick and you mix it up with a number eight with a ball carrier and you mix it with a six foot. So it all depends on the team you've got, uh, ideally. Uh, but in Wales, we haven't got a back row of 120k number eight and 120k number seven. Oh. Exactly. Um, who just bully physical teams, but that suits them. They couldn't put another player from Wales into that fit in that in that mould. It's different. Uh, so no. I'm saying it's like for us, we've got to work on the best team we've got and work around how we're going to play and how they suit at the same time. Well, mm. why do you think then I've asked this of of other people who've been on the pod? Why do you think then we aren't currently we don't have a crop of big physical back rowers in Wales? You know, we've got like the guys and. You got you got one or two like Fender coming around the place. You've got yeah. Ben Carter. There's, there's one or two, but we're in a small nation. Let's not forget that England have a player pool twice the size, almost three. South Africa got a bigger player pool and Jeanette. Yeah. So we've got a Fender. We've got a Ben Carter. We've got people around the place, but not everyone that size. And that's what we got to realize that we're not going to build or breed that many. You'll you'll have one or two in another generation that come through from academy. You have another two again, but we're not going to have. Eight or nine every year, these size players. It's the same with back row players as well, aren't we? We don't have big physical back rows, do we? No, like I think the last time we had a massive number eight was Scott Quinnell. Yeah. I I could think of playing generation. I don't think we've had another big number eight like him for a long time. Moriarty, I suppose. He breathes a bit more of a hybrid, doesn't he? Hybrid, yeah. But an out and out big number eight, I think it was Mm. Scott. I don't think anyone in Wales was that big at the time. No. No. no, so it, like it does, it does come in a generation. You might in two years' time see an 18s player coming through. You look at twenties, a couple of big boys in the twenties. Um, like for example, Morgan Morse, the kid is coming through. He's not a monster. But he's a fantastic rugby player. So you play him. Yeah, yeah Ryan Woodman, the Dragons Ryan as Woodman. well. Yeah, yeah. No, Ryan it's, uh... He's a fantastic player as well. So there's players there, but we can't put ourselves and look at Slap and go, oh, West Africa. Let's find the biggest guys. We're going to be waiting generations and. Yeah, they said Ben Carter, Matthew Screech, they're not small guys. No, Fender's no, not a small not. guy. James Rat, he's not, not a small guy. You name these players, there's some big guys mm. in the regions, but they're not six foot nine, six foot eight, like a Luke Chartres. Luke Chartres was a massive man. People didn't yeah. realize how heavy he was, they thought he was too slight. He was over 125k. He was a massive man. It always amazed me how people would get him up in the line because he was a <laughs> it looked like a crane. I think it was in the World Cup and he had like 28 rucks and tackled 18 people in one game in South Africa. And people said, Oh, he didn't do much. Like, <laughs> it's not ball carry. Like, he's been horse, of course. And Luke was a fantastic player and he was a lot of the dragons when he was there. Yeah. I, I, I think if people don't know the game particularly well, I think stuff that Luke Charteris does that Dan Lydia does yeah. oh, doesn't God. get picked up, does it? You know, it's. Uh, it goes back when you appreciate as a player and probably as someone who knows the game, you appreciate the actual, the end scene work, to get this quick ball, to win rucks, to win collisions. They put their body in the line and like you see Dan's face and his body, the only option he's done is because he's actually committed so much of his body to the cause. And uh, you probably wish he was a bit more of a tip break so you could save his body a bit. But they all, <laughs> like, look for me, all the players in every game, people don't realise in the region, put their bodies on the line. And that's any yeah. jersey. The boys are phenomenal, and I, especially now I was not very lucky. Maybe lucky not to go against the South Africans that often. I never played them, so I see them down when they come down in 
use the university facilities, they are massive men. And, they the, are, boys, yeah. and the boys are hit to them on a regular basis. And you think to themselves, uh, fair dues to those boys. Like, I, I, I don't think I could have done it. I wouldn't have lasted as long as the South Africans came into the league earlier. No, no, absolutely. Um, you touched on scrummaging earlier. Um, this is an interesting question. This is from Ali. He gets in touch with us via Facebook. He's asking, when it comes to scrummaging, is it more important to have a strong front row than a second or back row? Or can bulky, stronger locks and back rowers compensate for a weak front row? What would you say to that, Hill? How important mm-hmm. is it to have a strong front row and the back yeah. row and second row? It is an eight-man scrum. You can't have one or the other. But if you can't have a platform to push on, so if you haven't got a front row that's stable enough or strong enough, they don't, you don't matter what weight's going, it has to be going somewhere. So mm-hmm. it's a... You probably need a, a strong front row, not the whole scrum, because you could have the three British lines and you could have a terrible back five. You still get pushed over. So it is, yeah. you can't blame one without the other. I would say you can't have a 150k sec row pushing on a pillow. So you need, <laughs> um, um, you need kind of a stable platform to build that tension, to have that weight transfer. So I would say to build a scrum, you need that front row first and then you need the back five to help out then. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. Uh, John gets in touch as well, also via Facebook, and he asks what he thinks about the on and off field changes at the Dragons and if they will have better seasons going forward. I know you're an Osprey now here and you've got a lot going on, but um, have you been um, keeping abreast of what's happening at the Dragons look, with all the changes and everything? Yeah, look, I'm keeping like, a lot of rugby. Like, it's my life at the moment. Like it's, <laughs> um, and I go, look, look, I've been there for nine years and yeah. Now, look, I get that it wasn't a 10 years, but things changed and I had to go. Um, but for me, like we trained the cabbage patch, let's be honest, there was nothing there when I was there. I came then when the Shermanach deal was there. I was there for two years with the Shermanach. It, it yeah. is fun. Um, having the ownership and kind of changing the way the route, the plan, having kind of uh, the success. One thing I felt we got rid of a lot of people quite quickly, a lot of history mm. there that we, if you look at the Dragons, <clears throat> who's the longest serving player there? And, Where's the history? And I feel like some of the regions keep probably one or two players on the transition them because they know the history of the club or the region and they know what makes things tick. And if you keep evolving so much, you don't become the same thing. And when mm. you start evolving and you need some, not history, but someone who's been there for the tough times or someone's been there or transitioned to a coach or someone's got the understanding of what the region is. And um, yeah. But I think they go in the right direction. I think all it's tough for all regions. It's, it's, yeah. it's honest. Like um it's very tough for all the regions and this it, we've got to support them. And you look at the wage caps, the salary caps, and look at the young players that are coming through so quickly that they wouldn't be there that quick. They probably would have a few years in the Welsh Prem, the Championship, and the Super Rugby Company. Now they're benching not regional rugby because we haven't got enough depth in the squad. No matter what team or what badge, they've mm-hmm. got to support the whole region as much as we can. Absolutely. Yeah, we can all get behind our message. Uh, let's talk about the current state of the Welsh rugby then. So uh, this is where it gets a little bit <laughs> doom and gloom, I'm afraid. But I think it is a, you know, an important topic to cover. So it's fair to say the Welsh rugby is in a difficult place right now, on and off the field. We saw Wales pick up the wooden spoon in the Six Nations, uh, and they've lost nine tests in a row. We've now fallen out of the top 10 in the world rankings. Um, the Welsh teams are struggling to be competitive in the URC, with the exception of the Ospreys, of course. Um, credit to Toby Booth to the brilliant job they against all the odds. But as a whole, they are struggling. Um, grassroots participation numbers are falling. Some clubs, as you know, are struggling to put a team out on the field. So what do you make of the game in Wales at the moment, Hugh? Are you hopeful the Welsh rugby can bounce back from this really difficult period we find ourselves in? Uh, like we're in a trough right now. Like, yeah, I think COVID's killed a lot of things. Let's be honest, I'm not blaming one person. COVID's hurt a lot of the industry and it's hurt mm. not just our industry, business sectors, everything's closing. The cost of living is going through the, through the roof. Um, So yeah. uh, the games on TV, I'm not going to watch the game. Some people can't afford a ticket. It is a lot of things have changed. Um, mm. Can't put one finger on it. Um. Mm. Grassroots, I found coaching grassroots difficult when people start paying money for one club, the other, often £50 year, £40 year, and yeah. it becomes a love again, becomes gone. And uh, and we have to go back to how do we find the love for the game again? I think we've lost the love. There's so much negativity about everything at the moment. And then and then you just said that you all those stats out, there's nothing positive, and we've become quite negative as a nation. I think personally, like that goes to players as well, that people 
people say he's not good enough or he's not good enough or he should be doing that and when it becomes a bit of, I think uh, I find we find I don't know if we're Welsh but find doom and gloom more exciting for us other than a positive note if that's a Welsh thing, isn't it? We it are is synonymous with doom and gloom. We, we love find, it. We could find the best rugby 20s player, but he's not Cam Nelson. But we find yeah. someone who's not as strong as him. And, oh, he's not good enough. And, and then we can quite insular as a region. They go, oh, my region's better now we're playing. And only too many, there's too many Cardiff players. There's too many not him. And then there's <laughs> the one. And I hope yeah. one week goes away. You know, I just find it. I just find sometimes that we've got to go back to loving rugby and love rugby and love playing rugby. And okay. I, it sounds crazy. I think that's what's happened. I find that we find negativity the best thing. And I mean, we can't wait for someone to be. We're looking for a player's downfall or a region's downfall. I think yeah. when they, or the four might go. Yes, I hope it's not. I hope it's so and so. I hope he goes. Well, there's a business going away where people's livelihoods go in. Yeah. yeah. We're not going to find a region. And people are loving it. And I think I see Twitter then. And people jump on a bandwagon. Can't wait for the doom and gloom. And I think to myself, this push just speaks. Okay, we're not winning now. Let's get out the top ten. Let's get in the top eight. This is let's be excited to push on. Let's be excited for the new talent. Let's be excited for the new Oscars of a new stadium and have a packed stadium. Let's be excited for the dragons to do well. Let's get the scars back. I mean, I find sometimes we're just so doom and gloom about mm. the general. That's always been there, you know. I'm I'm old, so I remember yeah. the days pre-internet and. You know, kind of, and it was always a bloke would be at the bar in the rugby club saying, "Oh, why are they picking him, man? He's rubbish, look." <laughs> but, but you, you know, you'd always say, "Oh, shut up! You don't know what you're talking about." But now oh, there's so many of them, and they're amplified by Twitter. You yeah. can't tell them just to shut up and get on with their beer. I'm not saying um, no. I'm not saying no kind of opinion, but you keep talking negativity. When's the positive going to find out? Because we become so numb to negativity because oh yeah yes, yeah this is happening again. But I think. We need to, right when a trough now they've decided a new league Super Rugby Cumbria. This is mm-hmm. why the budget threshold. We're trying to get the young guys playing. We're trying to get many minutes as possible. Spoke to the referees. They're trying to speed the game up. They're trying to, some exciting stuff. Let this be. By oh, the budget and the leagues will be rubbish now. Someone said it's only be ten games. The boys are going to play and you know, no one's going to watch our league. And it's just like come on now. It's just back some. They've tried something new. Let's be excited for some challenge. It's just. Let's just be us. Let's just put a brand out there. Let's be excited about something. And I find, as soon as we, as a collective, you can have an opinion, but as soon as we can be as strong as a collective, and I think the region is showing up. They're, they're the PRB, but they're trying to be as tight as a group that we can fight for something and push for a cause. And if that's just starting a new league now with Super Rugby Cymru and get a few new guys playing and and then having that open day in the day St. Helens, pushing that brand for the Ospreys and we had fans watching the university training against the Ospreys and seeing new faces down there because of Bouncy Castle, but they're there to watch rugby as well and changing rugby just from a game to an event. I don't know. Let's just try to be excited about something like, like it rains so much in Wales, I can't be handled being wet. And then <laughs> yeah. reading the bad news and getting a bit, you no, know, I'm trying to be positive and it is doom and gloom sometimes. You can't hide away from what we've gone through as a nation. No, can't you can't. Gone. But we can have seen some silver linings from it. The women's game is changing. Like the new league is happening. They've changed the league for a change. And there's new you know, things can be exciting. Twenties, okay. We're not having enough overseas players or we're not breeding enough senior players. But look at these young twenties guys who are gonna woodman or a morse. Uh, doing these guys are playing through the skin and they're gonna like, break through and they're yeah. gonna be able to picture. like that's like maybe I'm just maybe too positive, but I've no, I don't it's nice about positivity. No, I think in I, Welsh rugby, there's not enough of it. And you're I, right, I, it is a Welsh thing, though, isn't it, to be so negative? But uh, sorry, Gav, go on. Well, and, and I think part of the issue, and this isn't just a Wales thing, because you know I'm involved in the community yeah. game in England. That the problem is the idea that you know you would grow up kind of idolizing whoever played for your village or your town or whatever. And then, you know, your ambition wouldn't be, oh, well, you know, I open get a professional contract. It'd be, well, I, I want to play for Tumble or Ebervale or Tredega or wherever you grow up. Uh-huh. And we've lost that now. And we see it in the English game as well, that there's, you know, there's not much loyalty. And, you know, kind of, I am involved at a very low level, but there's not even much lo- loyalty at the very low level that I'm involved with. And players will shift around, you know, to whoever will pay the biggest expenses for training and ever, and and I think it's just become more of a business, and and you know you sound like a rugby romantic in the same way I am. You know, I still love the game, mm. and, you know, and the kind of mud and blood of it all, 
Uh, and <laughs> yeah, and I think if we get back to that, realizing what rugby is, it's just one of the purest sports in terms of physical comp- competition. Yeah. And I love it for that. Yeah, I, I think I, 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 I'm so happy. Like the tumble rugby, if you go through the whole junior section, you play seniors, you have a special tying cap. <clears throat> So you have left the club, you've got straight to the juniors and you have a senior cap. You have a different cap and a different tie because you've committed a cause to the club. And it, look, there is things that people, look, cost a living. I know some boys would rather work a shift on a Saturday and play because mm. they've got to pay the bill. Yeah. Like, we can't take away from the cost of living and people are like, oh, you've got to play a game. So, well, I can earn more than a couple hundred quid doing a shift. I can put myself on call and I'm playing a game of rugby. And we can see where we are since COVID that that money now is so tight with some people. Equipment for some kids, like we've got to understand that it costs subs, equipment, kit. Some people can't afford that, and we've got to kind of make rugby a, a beautiful game. That how we support these people, and like I said, this you can't have a go at someone and go. I'm gonna take a call. I'm gonna go on no. call every weekend to pay my bills, and I think the cost of living mm-hmm. is putting a huge strain on us as a nation. And then you see the counteract of people not playing Saturday, or I'm not going to the club to play a game or have a pint because or I'm not going to watch a game because I got to do a shift. Or it is, it, I think it's not just rugby. I think it's us as a nation at the minute. We're all yeah. okay at the minute, the cost of living, and it's quite tough. And we've got to be realistic there. But it's how we can support each other in that, in the climate now. Yeah, and I mm. think COVID showed us there's other things you can do. And you don't necessarily have to be hauling yourself to some godforsaken bit of West Wales, East Sussex, Scottish Islands, wherever you play rugby over weekend, you can do other things. Yeah, and I, I think that generation probably who were blocked away and probably haven't got that love we've gone through in my generation. We've had two year break of sport, realistically. And yeah. As you said, there's the bigger things in rugby and football, or like I kind of, and don't forget, football's taken over as a nation as well. Since we go forward, rugby in my age, it wasn't much football in the area. Now, football is more prominent in the areas than there's rugby. So, yeah. we're a natural competitor. Football was yeah. North Walian in my head. You know, that's something the people in Wrexham did or or Northland did know. It's not something you did in the valleys. Well, for me, it was Swansea and Cardiff, then West Wales, with rugby, maybe a few village football games on Saturday, and a little bit now is football camps, is schoolboy football, is my, oh, my son's got in the six years old into a, a football schoolboy competition. You're only six, and I have to play kit and subs, and but it's exciting. It's really good drills, and they have fun doing it. So it's we've got competitors now that we never had before as a nation in football, and now it's we've got to kind of adapt to it. And there's yeah. other sports as well, and stuff like MMA and stuff. I know boys who left Welsh rugby to go and do jiu-jitsu or, and things like that. On a, on a Wednesday and a Sunday, it's hard on your body. You have a feel of a combat sport, but actually you're not wrecking your body so much. And it is. It, it's small things. And look, it's dementia coming out the woodwork now and collisions and parents are a bit worried now. And it, it is so yeah. much things that are happening in rugby at the moment that we've got to be self-aware of what's outside this, what's happening. And things where people will change and Trends will change, and hopefully this trough now will kind of rebuild, rebrand, and then come out of it again. We should be smart, and when it is a peak, we're going to stay on that peak. Yeah, I can remember the Welsh team in the 80s, so, you know, yeah. it does get better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that to everyone, it does get better. Like, I used to be the Dragons, you know, a Dragons fan, we know we're some tough times, and it is some good, like, yeah, yes. <laughs> we certainly <laughs> know that. <laughs> look, 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 I, like, I put the duty on, I've been in some tough games, and some really fun, yeah. exciting games, but... There is peaks and troughs. It's just how we stay loyal and how we work hard. And like I said, there is a lot of doom and gloom at the minute in the world, not just in rugby, and how we can mm. end up, how we spin the narrative and make it look. It's exciting. this new branding. It's exciting to see young players playing regional rugby. It's exciting how we go win. Okay, there's not much money, but obviously for young guys, I'll have a go. But then hopefully in the two or three years' time when rugby's got a bit of a boom again, then we can support with some quality overseas signings as well. Yeah, absolutely. But there is a lot of negativity also around the URC. And this is something that we've spoken about on previous pods. A lot of people in Wales, they're just not taken to the URC for whatever reason. Now, me and Gav think it's got its flaws, certainly as in terms of the travelling and the costs around that. But there's some brilliant, fantastic teams this tournament. Um, 
but people just then buying into it because they want this Anglo Welsh league. You know, they crave those fixtures against Bath, Bristol, Exeter, Gloucester. Is that something you would like to see? I feel like I asked this question to every guest to yeah. come on now, but how would you feel about the potential I, of uh, I, I, Anglo I Welsh the, league? I remember the LV Cup. I yeah. know it was a bit fun, those the way it is, and, and I remember playing. The, you know, it was always Wales versus England. It was that's a mentality we've got, and it's English. And yet again, it's travel. We're going to fly, mm. fly to Italy every other weekend or at Scot- um, to Ireland or to Scotland, to Italy. It, it costs a living. And it's televised these days, so people aren't going to be well, watching a, watch a TV game at home. But if you say it's not televised, Bath versus Dragons in Roddy Parade, it's not televised. How many fans are going to come down and watch that and buy tickets? Mm. That yeah. They would, but my fear is I don't think the English clubs would allow that to happen. They no, won't just in their game. No. You know, would we would you get a crowd from the dragons with Zamtil would be my question. No, no, but like do do we like it's so many different things and you go we as as like I said, the national government body to do a British Irish League and have a conference like America do. Do we have I yeah. like Scotland and have half and half and have like Leinster versus Sarsen versus Dragon? I mean we it's so many things and you are see, but like this can I be brutally honest, it's them, there's figures of money there that's way above my head and why they do it and the reasons why. There's, there's a reason why the URC is doing what they do and there's a reason why it's, there's things happen. As much as we want to go, oh, we want to try this, there's a reason why. And no, yeah. there's some good games that makes it tough for going away to play in the cheat, uh, the cheat is going away to play in the Bulls or Sharks in South Africa and, and have a learning and different experiments, but you won't have travelling fans. So. No. There's certain things, there's negatives, and there's, but anything you can say under everything, it's negative, positive, everything. It's just the reason why mm. we do, why we do it, and why we want it to happen, happen, and how can we make it happen. And that's the question. And I think it's above my pay grade and way above <laughs> who other people. And but like, like this, if we wanted to get the URC, would what would happen to Ireland and Scotland? Do they want to carry on? And there's few things that could happen. And you said it's going to be a plan of action and a plan in a few years' time. If it's going to move, do we do have a world league or do we have a European? Do you mean it's the things you can yeah. choose massively? Yeah. Do, a, do I, we bring France into it and have a conference and leagues and have a European league? But the French are loving life at the minute. The division yeah. in Div One and like Sammy Davis is playing now when he's on the full stadium and doing really well. So mm. France don't really care. So the French teams don't really care because they're doing really well. So. If the URC was doing really well and the regions are playing really well and we're winning stuff, would we moan and stay in the URC? It just, it just yeah. pulls the cons at the minute where we're at. And um, there's a reason why in the URC, there's people know why. Like, my pay, but my pay, great. But like I said, if we won a Welsh Anglo League, what happened to British, Scottish, and Irish? Are they going to carry on or do they want to come into a different league? And it's not going to affect us. It'd be a knock on effect a lot of teams and how they want to carry on and they want to come into negotiations. So you have to wait and see. And I said, like they said, there's stuff probably going in the back, and we don't know what's happening. Mm, no, yeah. no one knows. I, I bet as a player, though, particularly as a front rower, you would have loved the opportunity to go out and play the Loftus first veld. Or... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially, yeah. Uh, no, like, like I said, like, I don't think I, I, people out there not playing, and we said, well, I don't think I would have. I watched these guys walk around the place, the Sharks, and they played the Scars. So that was no training venue, and I thought, I don't think I could call. I've been playing against Bordeaux Beagle, and that's the biggest team I played in Ronnie Braid with 150k tight dead, with mm. 150k second row. And I thought, oh my God, my body couldn't handle that after two days. <laughs> Doing that for two weeks in a row out of South Africa, you're going to say to these boys, as much as they win or lose, how much they put their body on the line for the region, you're going to go against these teams. And I got to say, the boys out there are doing a fantastic job with what they've got. And I think to them, hats off to those boys, the regional yeah. boys. Absolutely, fair play. Um, let's talk about Super Rugby coming next. You did touch on the area, yes. So um, this is the new competition, which is designed to bridge the gap between the amateur and the pro game. Now, when this competition was first sort of put forward, um, the proposals, there was a negative reaction from some clubs, wasn't it? Um, but how are you feeling about, well, yeah, that's an understatement, isn't it? Uh, Neef, Ponty, et cetera. Um, yes. Are you excited about this new competition? And do you think it's the right way to close that gap between semi-pro and pro rugby? How do you feel about this new competition going forward? I, I, we've got to be excited about it. There's something different. There's new rule changes. We're trying to support the referees. We're trying to speed the game up or reset scrums, uh, allowing more jackals. Allowing, like, it's exciting. It's going to be... Um, like, there's a lot of investment. They've, they've, they've got to decide what they're going to do when they've made a decision. I agree on the 150 cap. Uh, we well the Swans yeah. have always been one that will always like we're open about that before we say actually we don't pay the highest but it stops people leaving Swansea to go play for another 
to drive an hour away to play for an extra £200. That yeah. the local boys, and we have local Swansea boys playing and local Swansea coaches and um and other clubs as well. I know I've got the same lot trying to push a lot of boys from Patalbin into the into their club. But you know this and it takes away the lot of I'm gonna go there for a five hundred pound, negotiate more with me. And I'm like, well, it's not about that, it's about playing rugby to have the opportunity to play on TV or SOC or, or click. I'm not particularly yeah. then to move on and play for your region and hopefully get a Welsh Cup and some boys will not carry on. Some boys will be super big company players and they love it. And some boys will have an opportunity to move on. But for me, it's the right way of doing it. Why are you playing rugby for and playing for the badge? The old playing for the badge is wrong, pretty wrong, but playing for a reason and not just yeah. And I think, so, yeah, the days have gone now of some clubs are still doing it below the super rugby company. And we, we are strict. The WI was strict with us. It's an ordinary process that we have to do with, with payments and make sure that we don't go over our budget and, and um, targets we've got to hit as well America so this really it's a real professional league we're trying to get to professional league would I like more money everyone does every coach and every club will say that but the reason mm. why I'm doing it I spot up with the Bayou. so okay. do you think no, no I'll ask a different question actually so you're you know you're going to be coaching in it <laughs> and there'll be people who you know, don't know those players who are the who the clubs, who the players and the clubs in that in Welsh or Super Rugby can we that you think, yeah, these are the ones to watch. Clearly Swansea, but <laughs> young team up there. Look, um, Cardiff always have the good youngsters. They, they've done it for a while. They put the, the young team through. Um, only thing with Cardiff is the inconsistency. Probably if one week they have a really good team, the next week they probably might not because of the players being pulled in yeah. and out. Mm. Um, Newport, I think they haven't changed much this year. They had a fantastic team last year. Same for the Drovers. Um, yeah. But I feel some of the clubs have got an agent profile, and they know that a few players will carry on for another year or two, and then they kind of have to transition. Yeah. Some clubs have gone young early. I think our brand like a lot of young players ready to work with them for the next three years. We're in the league. Um, I think it's going to be exciting. I don't think it's going to be clear cut as what it has been in the past. Can I, I'll be honest, a franchise. Paying the most will win the most. It's like anything. Like, come on, City, you buy the most league, no matter what you say, you buy the best players, you're going to win. It is just money franchise. You can have your dogs. Like the, but then having yeah. a bit more easy playing field that people aren't going to jump ship for an extra hundred pounds that because of traveling or the boys will work hard because they've got a bit of love from the club. I think you might oh. see the best more out of, of the league. Oh, no, I won't ask you to name anyone because it won't be fair. But have you got lads at Swansea who you think will be regional players in the next couple of years? I've got some players who played as your rugby last year. And I think yeah. they're fantastic. Like Luca Giannini, like Josh Phillips at 10 from Ponty's come down. I think he's fantastic. I've got some really young players like Harson Doe in the academy who playing as rugby for us. Keen Hayes with us. Um, Ben Roberts, second row, who's worst qualified. He's been in California Swans Uni. He's six seven, six six, big man. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Callum Dodd on the wing, one hundred four k winger. He's massive, powerful guy. He's just qualified from the university. And what you see is a lot of rugby teams, rugby company teams, are signing university students for the Bucks League. Mm-hmm. They're qualified now, coming out of 21, 22, and they've had a really good program. So actually, they're really good athletes coming out who are qualified now. Um, and it's quite exciting. A couple of boys have gone to Newport. I've sent them to Newport. A couple of boys have gone to Abrava. And it, it's nice to see that not just us, Cardiff Uni as well, Cardiff Uni University. I've had a couple of players go across. See what's met that the some players now are coming out of Bucks League, going into semi pro league. And it is a pool of resource now to recruit from. So it's a really good young talent. Yes, they will make mistakes because they're not perfect in the end. But hopefully the game will speed up and a lot of young guys are playing rugby and want to push this brand of rugby as well. Mm, okay. We have a question from an Osprey fan who contacted the show asking, um, Darren, his name is, what are your ambitions for Swansea RFC this season? I mean, you probably would like to win the competition, oh, wouldn't you? Win, <laughs> win, win Cup and League? No, like for me, like to like win a few more games we did last year. I mm. think we're inconsistent. I think we only had a squad of 19 signed, uh, contracted, the money we had. We've got 32 signed now, so consistency is huge. Uh, I think that's huge for us, is being consistent with the players with pool we had. With that, then we can breathe, you know, understanding and not swapping and changing. We got relationship building. Uh, I like to push the mid-table this year. I really do. I really want to push up then, get through then, and see how we go from then. then. Yeah, I'm looking forward to new competition. I am. I think yeah, it's something so new, it's fresh. And we had to do something, didn't we? Because I'm sure you agree with me, Hugh. The gap between semi-pro and pro URC, it was just too big, wasn't it? And, you know, I know this wasn't uh, popular with a lot of clubs, but for me, the WRU had to act. 
and the gap between the semi-pro clubs. You can see clear split of money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the, 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 that league is like last year. The Premiership was split in two, essentially, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. you you had like everyone from Ebervale up was just operating at a very different level to the clubs below them. Yeah. It is, and that's what you see now. It's a bit more. That's why the WA took a while. They audit the process and make sure it was in the right, you know, plan of action. We had to go through a lot of work, paperwork. Each club did uh, mm. to apply for it. It wasn't just yeah, take a box you're in. A lot of application were in, a lot of hard work from each club, and you no know, Swansea yeah. not. I didn't do much. I just signed a few documents for the club itself. Um, were fantastic in what they, their, their plan was for the club itself in the next three years, and it's exciting to be part of that journey for at least at least this year as it is. Oh, good stuff. Okay, so let's end on this note then. So nine years at the Dragons, you obviously had highs and lows. Any particular matches and memories that stand out for you during your time at Ronnie Parade? <laughs> when we beat the Ospreys in Rodney Parade yeah. um, it's in our I with that line break and I uh, <laughs> um, we beat the Ospreys and they had Jerry Collins Lee Byrne Ryan Jones Galacticos uh, yeah. I was, and it was me Patrick Palmer and Steve <laughs> um, and that was a good memory um, mm. beating Edinburgh away in the rain with Toby Fardo's debut game I um, remember him yeah. playing the Skull Cup and his big Afro wet, and he was phenomenal. Yeah. Then I loved it. Uh, he's a phenomenal guy, top bloke as well. I love a player. Uh, playing against Toulouse, um, boys beating. The, I was on the bench, but beat in Star Francais away from home. Mm. I think there's some games there, like going away to uh, Treviso, spending enough time. We had Bogliano in the cup the week after. I remember staying up there for two weeks over before Christmas. We were in Venice as a group and. Beat, yeah. don't, I think we lost three or beat Mogliano on the cup and there's a lot of ups and downs but just spending time with good guys and I used to love going to work came at the age at the stage where it can be difficult to go in but then at one stage I used to love going in and they asked me on the bench or not I used to love going being on those guys and the ethos of Dragons and I, it was fantastic to be around and I just I think people know I, I, we, we had really, really tough times with Dragons and we mm-hmm. lost the fans a bit of we were poor at some stages and we lost. And I remember just being privileged to make sure the boys knew that you know, a, lot yeah. of, a lot of people passing through the jersey and we would make sure even though it wasn't a man of Gwent, I felt proud of putting that jersey on, trying to represent the, you know, the region of Gwent and I made sure yeah. when I put on any jerseys, I try to make sure like I make sure the region, the history and the proud. And I remember playing, for, I, look, I played for every feeder club for the Dragons. I, for Pond- <laughs> I listed some of them earlier, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember one week I played for Ponderpool, the week after I played for Crosskeys against Ponderpool. It was crazy <laughs> for stages. <laughs> Bed was a spot, I played for every part. So I, I am probably, yeah, a true West Whalian, but who probably reflected more of a man of Gwent, played for every club out there. So, uh, well, you know, we, you know, can in the Gwent Valleys, we build props as well. That was always our thing. So, you know, you're a, uh, you're an adopted son of the, the, the Gwent Valleys, whether or not you want to be. Yeah, but like I said, it's a massive privilege. And I you know I have been on Ronnie Parade for a while, but every time I go down there, it always brings a smile to my face, a couple of stories here and stories from players. And you no, know, it's some, I know it is a tough time for all regions, not just the Dragons, but like I used to make sure there's a good history. And I'm, I'm proud of representing the Dragons for nine years and met some good friends and met some really good people there. Oh, great stuff. Yeah. It's been really nice to hear you say that as well, you know, because some players may not have that affection, you know, for some of the clubs they play for. But you really did enjoy your time, didn't you, at, at Ronnie Parade, even though they were they were difficult times. You loved yeah, it. No, I remember the fans went to stage with Shaw Goose for Sakari, and there's some stuff like I like yeah. fans after game and you now going back to the Bisley Lounge, but now in the new one, it wasn't really the club house back in the day. You have to go to the club, walk up the club house, see you now see family and friends and you speak to fans and no matter what, when I lose, fans would never turn on you too much and they would talk to you afterwards and they would treat you with respect as much as anybody else. So that's one thing I would say that like they had some good fans up there. They wouldn't kind of turn your back on you completely and no. we'd be sure that. Yeah. No. But like I said, I'm you no know, I'd spent nine years up there. I lived in Newport for, for a couple of years. I love the still love the city when I go up there and it's um it's a nice place up there as well. But no, like I said like I'm privileged to be on the podcast and it's a true privilege to play for the Dragons for nine years. Ah, oh, brilliant stuff. Um, Gav, anything else before we wrap up? No, I think that's a perfect place to leave it. It's a lovely place to end it, isn't it? <laughs> Hugh, thank you so much for joining us. Like yeah, I say, I know you've got all these jobs going on and uh, time <laughs> is uh, pretty tricky through these days, so I'm, I'm glad you were able to join us and have a, a really good chat. It is much appreciated. Thank you so much.
No problem. Uh, Gav, thank you as always. And thanks to you, the listener, for downloading this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back very soon with another special guest. But until then, take care and goodbye.